Thank you all. Um, so I guess um, by by way of introduction, I uh, was part. There, there was a, a five year hiatus after the Vietnam War in uh, when the draft and even registration for draft was suspended. Uh, what seemed seemed then like it was going to be an eternity, but work out to be in retrospect a very brief period. I was in the first group of people who was supposed to register when registration was somewhat surprisingly and unexpectedly uh, for me as it is for young women today, I think took us very by surprise when it was brought back in 1980. And I was involved in organizing at that time, ended up being one of those who was picked out when in the face of unanticipated, although they should have anticipated it, uh, widespread non-compliance, the government tried to intimidate the resistance into silence um, by uh, prosecuting uh, a handful of troublemakers like myself, um, after which uh, that having served only to publicize the resistance, um, registration continued, but enforcement was abandoned. And we've had this stalemate for the last 35 years where registration has failed and a draft isn't really possible. But there's been no face saving way for the government to end registration without admitting that the draft isn't possible. So they've both continued registration and more significantly continued to engage in war planning that presumes that a draft is always a fallback option and thus that war planners need consider no limits to the availability of uh, soldiers and um, no need to consider whether people would be willing to fight the wars they're planning. Um, so that's um, that's how I came into this, and I've been um, working once again in recent years with some of the folks uh, before you and others um, to try to um, pass on to the next generation of draft resistors um, some of this legacy, and to more again more importantly to work as an ally uh, to them uh, and to that next generation of resistance. All right, thank you so much. I'd love to introduce uh, Rosa now. Hi, my name is Rosa Del Duca. Um, I am a veteran and conscientious objector. My army story briefly is that I joined when I was 17 years old, uh, still in high school. It was a year before 9-11. 9-11 uh, happened. I was studying journalism in college, so I was kind of paying attention to how the war unfolded. And um, I uh, disagreed wholeheartedly with how the Iraq war uh, was started and how it was concocted. And I um, you know, was, was really having a lot of conflicts about my service. And I thought there was nothing I could do except honor my contract until I found out the secret, maybe three or four years into my contract, I discovered that you can be a conscientious objector, even though you, you volunteered for the military, because now it's our all volunteer military or economic draft situation. And so, so that's what I did. And, um, you know, legal battles and uh, all sorts of, you know, I dug myself a deeper hole before I finally got out and well, how and why I got out was kind of a mystery because I was, my application was denied. But anyway, so that whole story is the subject of my, my book, Breaking Cadence, One Woman's War Against the War. And since it came out, I've, yeah, you know, like, um, I joined About Face, Veterans Against the War, and I'm in a truth and recruitment group. Uh, we're called before enlisting, and I'm yeah starting to do some speaking events and panels and stuff because uh, I got opinions, and <laughs> and um, I'm also here to learn from these people who have been doing this for far longer than than me. Uh, yeah, that's me, Rivera. Great, thanks, Rosa and Edward. Uh, so I'm Rivera Sun. I'm a protest novelist and an organizer and a trainer in strategy for nonviolent change. Um, and I come to this issue because my father was an anti-Vietnam draft resistor. He was a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War coming out of his Christian scientist background, which opposes war and militarism. Um, and he went even further. He was involved in activism against the Vietnam War, including blocking naval maneuvers and even going so far as to fly people over the border to Canada to get out of the draft. So he was a very active resistor, and it's in that legacy that brought me to this issue. Um, I am too old to be drafted at this point, uh, so I'm one of the, the last generations of women who did not have to even consider this question 
it wasn't on our plate. Um, and so, but I, when I heard that the Congress was thinking about expanding the draft to young women, I immediately knew that that was heaping injury onto injury and injustice onto injustice. And so I penned an op-ed opposing this uh, proposed maneuver. And that's how I got in touch with Edward and this network of, I don't know how many organizations we have, like 20 plus organizations who are working to uh, abolish the draft registration system and indeed the draft for all genders. So thank you, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you so much, Rivera. And I could just give a little brief introduction to myself. Uh, my name is Sebastian Mendoza. I'm a student at Dartmouth College. I'm studying women's gender and sexuality studies alongside government as, as well as Chinese. Um, and I'm also a student organizer involved in Feminists Against the Draft, which is a coalition of intersectional feminists who opposes draft registration in all forms uh, on the grounds of intersectional feminism. Um, and I also work on other student organizing related to humanitarian issues as well as peace building. Um, and yeah, I guess with that, uh, I would love to move into questions. Um, so the first question I have for panelists um, is where does America stand on draft registration? Um, and you can answer this uh, in terms of public opinion, in terms of the current debates in Congress, or in terms of how media is addressing it. Um, so yeah, whoever would like to begin, uh, please let me know. I'll, I'll take a crack at that, if I may. I think in some ways, the most meaningful measure of where people stand is how they are voting, not in words or polls, but how they're voting with their bodies, what they are actually doing. And the reality is that um, although Selective Service claims that 90 plus percent of people, men who are now subject to the requirement to register for the draft are in compliance, their measurement of compliance is grossly inaccurate. They count anybody who has ever registered at any address um, when the measure, the real measure is, would they be able to deliver an induction notice? Um, which means they have to be able to prove that they got it to you so they can prosecute you if you don't show up. So they need a means of provable delivery. Men are supposed to report to the selective service within 10 days every time they change their address until age 26. They're the only people other than those under court supervision for having been convicted of a crime in this country who are required to report to the police every time they move, but nobody does. Within two years of the start of registration in 1980, the only time there's been an audit of the database, they already found that most of the addresses were out of date. Um, now it's clear, and even the former select director of selective service who managed the start up of the system in 1980, testified a couple of years ago to a national commission studying this, that the database would be his words, former director of selective service, quote, less than useless, close quote, for an actual, uh, an actual draft. Um, so, the reality is that most people register or are registered only if it is sort of a corollary consequence of getting a driver's license. Um, I should note critically for this audience of academics, it was until recently a requirement that you register for the draft um, in order to get federal student aid. That has been repealed, although most people haven't realized that the repeal only just took effect. The question is still going to appear on the FAFSA for the next two years, but you can now legally ignore it and it's going to go way off the FAFSA form, which means that compliance is going to get even less. The main driver now is um, driver's licenses. State legislatures have enacted laws in a majority, although not all states, um, that require you to have registered or automatically register you when you get a driver's license if you're a man of 18 through 26. But there are enough gaps in those state laws um, that that doesn't really work in terms of making a draft feasible. Notably, uh, among other states, California does not require uh, you to have registered in order to get uh, a driver's license. Some of the other major states that don't have such laws uh, include uh, Massachusetts um, with its huge student population, um, uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, there are a few others. So in terms of what people actually think about it, most of those subject to a draft um, have voted no, passively staying home. Um, and there's pretty clear evidence that a draft wouldn't work. What the public thinks about it um, is, is, is a whole different question. Yeah, I can chime in with that as well to just say that 
you know, um, as soon as the the word started getting out that Congress was even considering expanding uh, the draft to women, and they really didn't want to even consider this. I think it's important to note they only took this up because a court case uh, run by a bunch of men uh, that said, you know, it's unjust that women don't have to register for the draft. Um, and so then the court ruled that that was true and that Congress needed to do something about it, which set in motion a whole charade of a public process um, where they re the commission who studied it, studied, really manufactured, and, and Edward especially watched this very closely, really manufactured a set of recommendations to Congress that was pro-draft, while actually the majority of the comments that were submitted to this commission opposed expanding the draft to women and uh, also expo opposed uh, the draft system in general. Uh, we saw firsthand that they really didn't want to listen to anti-draft feminists, that we were very marginalized in the experience, and that the sentiments of pro-war feminism if there can be such a thing, I'm, I'm a little dubious personally, um, were really prioritized in what got relayed to Congress, which was not the, the information that they were receiving from the public. It was the view of the commission itself. So just so you know, the, the attitudes around this are a very manufactured set of attitudes. And this goes right down into how media handles it. You either see um, pro-war sexists who don't want the draft expanded to women because women should stay at home and have babies uh, and tend the house and that sort of thing. Or you have pro-war feminists who think that it's a matter of equality to draft women into the military. And in a minute, we'll, I'll debunk that for you. Um, but this goes down to journals like the New York Times and Washington Post, who have been very, um, from our view, very slanted in how they're covering this issue and largely failing to even acknowledge that the bulk of the commentary and the, the feelings around this issue is actually in opposition to the expansion and uh, in favor of abolishing the selective service. Yeah, thank you both so much. And that really is directly to the next question I would love to ask, uh, which is how does the issue of the draft, expansion of the draft uh, play into broader feminist arguments between inclusion as progress uh, and other conceptions of feminist liberation? Uh, so overall, would the inclusion of women in the military draft be feminist? Uh, why or why not in your, in your view? Well, I'll go to bat on that one first and then pass it around. So no, absolutely not, hands down. Let's just stop talking about this as a feminist goal. Uh, people who think it's a feminist goal say, oh, well, equal, equal bodies, equal bodies in the draft system must be fair and just, right? But we have to remember that the military draft is fundamentally an injustice. It is involuntary conscription into military service, which is a form of enslavement. Right, Let's, we just have to be very clear when we start talking about this issue, what we're talking about. We have to remember that women actually do have equal access, at least uh, theoretically and legally, to every level of military service. So equal opportunity for women in the military exists, should that be your, your chosen expression of equality and feminism. Um, what we're actually talking about is taking an injustice and expanding the injustice rather than abolishing the injustice. And just as we didn't, we don't say that slavery is made more just by um, enslaving not just Africans, but uh, native peoples or Hispanic peoples. So too, do we have to be really clear that we do not make more justice in, in military conscription by expanding it to women. The only way to make justice out of this situation uh, is to abolish the selective service for all genders. This is in keeping with the feminist value of um, trying to secure uh, better rights, well-beings, freedoms, and justice for people of all genders. Feminism is not just a women's bodies first. It is equality and equity for all bodies and all peoples and all genders. So um, 
Yeah, I also j- will talk a little bit later on, I think, about um, other layers of what feminism looks like when we're talking about foreign policy and conflict resolution, uh, conflict styles and conflict management, because fundamentally, when we talk about the military and the use of a military draft, what we're talking about is how the U.S. decides to advance its goals and agendas. First of all, what are those goals and agendas? And are women and feminism equally represented in establishing those goals? And then what are the means of achieving those goals? And are the values of feminism and women being represented in even the availability of goals, uh, of means? So, you know, do we fund peace building, a feminist value, as equally as we fund the military? And the answer to that is no, not even close. So if we want to see true feminism, we have to stop accepting these kind of false paradigms of like superficial equality in injustices and start to uh, push for what real equality looks like in the deep layers of addressing the reasons why we have a military, the reasons why we wage wars, the how we handle conflicts, how we address our foreign and domestic policy because they're actually tied very closely together, especially from a feminist lens. Um, and that's way too broad to get into on this particular panel, but just to remember that drafting women is not feminist. I'd like to piggyback off that too. Um, the military, it's a male dominated apparatus and it you know, even has its own justice system that's separate from the civilian justice system. And there are far more men on that, you know, making the decisions and making the rules that you're gonna have to follow. So if you, you know, this potential draft potentially you know opening up to to women all of all of that systemic wrong um yeah it just it just it doesn't uh doesn't make sense to like and now everyone can be taken advantage of now everyone can suffer under this separate wacky justice system that is um controlled mostly by men and and just you know as as a woman in in the military that some of the problems um, you know, uh, other world problems are, are amplified for you. You know, the rates of sexual assault are way higher. And it, just, just the attitudes in general, you know, you're always fighting to prove yourself um, and to be seen as, to be seen as, you know, like that you can do the same things and you have a right to be there. And, you know, you're not just a the, the labels, the labels that get smacked on people, especially Marines, um, Marine uh, women. Um, yeah, it, it just seems like the idea of expanding the draft to all women, and then it, it's just so, it, it's, it's kind of a toxic idea to me because one it shouldn't exist for anyone. You shouldn't be forcing anyone to do something that they don't want to do. But women, especially, like may not know how toxic it can be for women in the military. That's just my two cents. No, th- thank you so much. And uh, the next question I would love to ask is, the draft has been an issue that has affected different generations differently, uh, spanning from Vietnam uh, to Korea, and now today to the issue of draft registration and its potential expansion. Uh, Edward, you've written extensively on issues of ageism as they apply to intergenerational anti-draft activism. Um, and draft registration applies to those between the ages of 18 and 25. Uh, but after that, uh, doesn't necessarily apply the same. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on how the issue of age relates to draft registration and how we can build a intergenerational anti-draft movement. Thank, thank you, Sebastian. Um, you know, I, I think you know one of the intersectionalities here, and one of the reasons I think this is such a, an interesting potential issue for taking up, you know, in in, in the course of, of peace and justice studies is that people come to opposition to military conscription from so many different perspectives. And that's something I, I touched on in my article in the current piece, Chronicle, um, that you know, the military draft forces people, forces young people to kill or be killed at the direction of the state. And each of those elements is good and sufficient reason to oppose it. And different people have come to opposition to the draft from each of those perspectives and others. Uh, there's been a tendency, and I think this was something, one of the mistakes that was made back in the 80s, 
in a non-intersectional approach was there was a lot of sort of hierarchy of oppressions argument. Is this really a, an, art, an, an issue about age? Is it really an issue about race? Is it really an issue about class? Is it really an issue about gender? Is it really an issue about imperialism? Is it really an issue about authoritarianism? To which the answer of, of which the intersectional answer is yes, all of the above. Um, but people wasted a lot of time trying to, to, to prioritize those oppressions rather than figuring out ways to work with them. For myself, I came to this primarily as a youth activist for youth liberation. I had been involved in a variety of other, other causes um, related to that. And I mean, the selective service system, as I've just mentioned, is by definition an intent selective, and it selects according to all of these different dimensions, but certainly one of the most explicit selectivities. I mean, people will talk about universal service. Well, it turns out they're talking about compulsory service only for the young. The very fact that they could call that universal is symptomatic of both how profound and how unrecognized their ageism is. So the draft has actually, and historically, the draft has been central to motivating causes for youth movements um, and has, you know, the, the end to the draft has been a central demand of advocates for youth liberation. So I think it can and should be so again, which raises the question, I'm 61 years old, what am I doing in the youth liberation movement, which is about as silly a question as what am I doing as a white person trying to support Black Lives Matter? What am I doing as a man supporting feminism? We all, as ageism is old people's problem, and we need to work on it. And that's true both in terms of working against the oppression of young people in structural ways like the draft, but it's also true internally in figuring out how to apply to the anti-draft movement, which is among other things for us old people in the room, it's an issue of allyship with another oppressed group in their struggle for their liberation. And I hope that in ways that did not happen with my generation of young people who were patronized unbelievably by older anti-draft activists, we are able to apply to our allyship with the next generation of young people who will be facing the requirement for women to register for the draft in a couple of years. We'll apply some of those lessons of allyship and will amplify and foreground their voices and let them lead their own, own movement and define it for themselves. Um, and fundamentally, this is what our survival depends on. We old people have created the, the existential threats of nuclear weapons and global warming. We're not going to solve them by telling young people what to do. We don't have the solution. The, the solutions will be found if they're found by young people in ways that we old people could not anticipate. Our survival depends on youth liberation and our willingness to follow creative leadership um, of young people into a future that we could not imagine. And so that's why it's important both to young people as core to youth liberation as a component of a broader spectrum of movements for liberation. And in particular to us as old people, this is central to what allyship with young people in the movement for youth liberation means. Yeah, thank you so much, Edward. And if I can jump in here, um, I would just like to add, I think in terms of the anti-draft movement, it has, his, has historically been a youth and student-led movement. Um, when we're speaking about things like Vietnam, those who are being sent out to war, those who are being sent out in many cases to die, um, one third of those who died in Vietnam actually were draftees between the ages of 18 to 25 who essentially had no choice, in, who, had no stake in, had, who had no stake in this decision. Um, and that reflects on who, who was out in the streets protesting during Vietnam, during, the, during Korea. And now today, um, we still see this intergenerational gap between those who are, who are actively out there protesting and those who are actually subject to these laws. And I definitely agree with Edward on the, on the point that even though those who are older may not necessarily be affected by this rule, it's, a, it's an issue of injustice that affects everyone. Um, and even though youth are the ones, youth are the primary ones affected and you know maybe expected to be the ones primarily on the street um, it's those who are in Congress who are maybe 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, who are making these decisions, excluding youth and, ex and marginalizing their voices in the process. Um, so yeah, and, and also um, when we're looking at the difference between those who are making laws and those who are subject to them, uh, we can even look back at the draft in Korea and Vietnam, disproportionately drafting people of color uh, who are at the front lines of conflict um, while they're still uh, lacking certain specific rights back home. So um, definitely this ties back to a, a uh, 
a larger issue of a complete discrepancy between those who are making these laws and those who are subject to them and those who are expected to hold solidarity with others. Um, and definitely uh, uh, something you propose I completely agree with is that there are ways to find um, solidarities across difference. Um, and there are ways to build movements that actually are intersectionally addressing multiple aspects of this oppression. One thing that I found on this issue around ageism and the draft issue is that it is critically important that those of us who encounter this issue, who hear about it, who know about it, who know even a little bit of the history of draft resistance, go that extra mile to making sure the younger generation has access to that knowledge. Uh, because what, what I've found over and over again is that um, the young feminists that I've been in contact about this issue, they, they needed someone to put it on their radar, but they cared so passionately about it. I mean, somebody asked me on another panel, well, what do the young feminists think about this? And I was like, are you kidding me? They're like, this is bogus. This is totally ridiculous. This is like the stupidest idea ever. It, there was no whole spar. They weren't like, oh, maybe this is okay. Um, but somebody had to bring it to their radar. And if the media is not doing it, it's down to people like us, especially PGSA professors. You have a really special role in this particular issue in that you are directly connected to the young people who will be affected by it, right? So bring it up in your classrooms. I can't say that enough. Bring it up in your classrooms. Invite guest speakers to talk about it. We have, we're cultivating and working with uh, young people like Sebastian or some of my colleagues at Code Pink who are really articulate about it, great speakers about it, to talk about what is the history, how to resist, how, that resistance has stopped the draft before and Edward's here to prove it, um, that you know, this kind of thing, we don't have to just lie down and take it. And so uh, be that person who is the ally who reaches out and says, have you heard about this? Did you register? Do you know that you don't have to register? That you can resist and not register. Um, it's critically important. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, and with that, I would love to move to another related question. Um, so Recently, we've seen some pushback to recruitment in schools, um, recruitment that targets youth, especially in low-income areas, especially among the younger generation who may see um, some issues or harms with militarism in their communities. Um, so a question specifically I'd like to ask Rosa and uh, others can chime in as well is, do you see connections between the debate on registering for the draft and the truth and recruitment movement or the movement um, pushing back against recruitment that targets youth specifically? I guess yeah, but but a pretty um, pretty far connection. I don't think people are directly connecting the dots, um, but uh, I, I mean it's great to see that some places are pushing back against recruiters in their schools because you know public schools are required to grant access to recruiters or risk losing their federal funding. They're also schools are also required to give contact information of all seniors and you know that's part of why my truth and recruitment group is trying and trying to knock on the doors and get into schools and um, you know to just give kids some vital information some vital facts about what service can mean you know factual information like every contract is eight years I did not learn that until I was in my 30s and I was in the military for six years um, you know, um, you're not guaranteed the job you sign up for, you're not guaranteed uh, the GI rights bill, um, education money can sometimes come with strings attached, the sexual assault rates and um, PTSD, the fact that, you know, 20 veterans kill themselves in this country every day. We try to get them facts like that because the recruiters that are roaming the halls, of course, aren't going to be telling, um, telling kids th this. And I think, um, draft resistance, I, I, I wonder if, um, you yeah, know, people don't know that they don't have to do it, that they can resist, and they go down and they register for the draft, and I just, I wonder if seeds are planted that 
oh, um, I never even thought about the military before. And the recruiter comes in the, you know, the classroom with that sweet deal and the signing bonus and all of these promises that um, for, for many people, those, those promises don't come to fruition, you know. Uh, um, yeah, yeah it, it, it's a messy issue. And I think more pushback, I, for, I think recruiters don't belong in schools, period. Um, and I don't think, yeah, I don't think, I think draft needs to go away and recruiters also need to go away because if they, if they have to rely on um, almost like bribery and, and snake oil salesman tactics to get bodies into the military, then something is wrong on a very fundamental level. Yeah, so a follow-up question to that um, is, in many cases, youth who register for the draft are either unaware that they registered through it, through processes like uh, signing up for the, uh, getting their driver's license, or through processes that are that seeming are seemingly automatic, um, or are, are kind of uh, don't see uh, much significance or weight to the process, considering that it's just maybe a piece of paper or something that they do in passing or something that they're expected or required to do. Um, do you think that, uh, especially as it relates to truth and recruitment movement, um, if youth were provided more information about their rights in order in uh, in um, refusing to register for the draft or the significance of the registration, uh, do you think that there would be different outcomes when it comes to the youth rates of registration? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, we were just talking to um, a professor at San Mateo Community College, and she had students who are being harassed by recruiters almost on a daily basis. And they think that they have to talk to those recruiters. They have, they think that they have to answer the door and answer the phone. Um, and they, you absolutely do not. I don't think that youth are informed about their, their rights at all. But um, Susan ha had a question, I think, for the panel. So Susan, did you want to ask? Thank you, Rosa, and all of you. Thank you. My question is reverberating for some reason. I'm not sure why. I don't know how to stop that. I'll just whisper. Um, so my question is, I think she typed it in the chat. Yeah, somebody in the chat. Um, I'll have their mic on. Oh, I'll go to Edwards. Yeah. All right, I'll mute. So there's a lot of work around, this is kind of a feminist question, Rivera, and any of you who are who look at it from this angle. So there's Feminist Majority Foundation. A lot of people are really trying to get behind the Equal Rights Amendment being passed. And my students talk about teaching in the classroom, Rivera, and you and I have talked about this. My students can't believe that the ERA is still not passed and they, and they want it passed. And I, I have to agree with them. And I've told them that, that some of the conflicts around the ERA being passed is this very issue, right? That um, that a lot of people would then point to the, the ERA um, enabling the military to then, you know, have women uh, be accountable to the draft. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you, would we, should we get behind the ERA being passed? It's, it's something that's way overdue in my opinion. Um, it, it can, it's important, I think, to have women be named in the constitution um, more clearly as equal to men um, than just in the 14th amendment in that kind of more disguised language. So how do we reconcile that? Wanting the ERA to be passed with this, this issue about women's conscription. That's my question. Well, yeah, Edward, I'm sure you have some thoughts on this too, but um, first of all, uh, well, they just passed to draft women. So we might as well hurry up and get the ERA from that framework. There's really no excuse anymore. But if, on a deeper level, we really need to start pushing back to the government assumption about the connection between rights and duties, right? We're always told that uh, you have a duty to the government. You've got to pay your taxes. You've got to register for the draft. You know, you've got to do your duties. And yet the government is pretty robustly failing to ensure the 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 rights of the citizenry, 
the equal rights of women and men and people defining gender differently, the, the rights of people who are not uh, heterosexual, uh, the rights of people who are not white, the rights of people who are not rich. And so, you know, I think when we talk about this and we start to think what is our, our duties and our rights, we need to be a little, have a little more self-respect, I think, in some ways and start to critique the government's assumption that they have done their end of the bargain. And then second of all, those of us who are uh, our peace activists need to be really clear about pushing back against the assumption that service in the military should be the duty of a citizen, right? We should really critique that, question that. Why is that part of the moral obligations of a citizen, right? Um, and I'll leave it at that, because I think that's a pretty provocative question. Thanks. I, I think if, if I may yeah. follow up on that, yeah, um, following up on, on, on Rivera's comments, um, I, I think if you say that you have to earn your rights, that's saying they're not human rights, that there's some like, you know, quid pro quo, and there's something, it, 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 it denies the, the, the very idea of human rights. But there's also, you know, a couple of historical lessons. I mean, this, this since we're talking about intersectionality, this brings out, you know, debates that have occurred between liberal movements for equality, for black people, for gays, um, et cetera, and advocates for liberation, whether that's black liberation or women's liberation, the difference between equality and liberation, um, and what are we going for? But there's also just like the pragmatic argument. People have made this same pitch. They made it to black people, serve in the military and you will earn equal treatment. Didn't work out so well. They made that pitch. I mean, Japanese Americans who were interned in concentration camps during World War II were recruited into the military with the promise, you fight and prove your loyalty, you know, maybe we'll let your families out of the camps. There was also, I might add, some of the strongest draft resistance in America during World War II was by Japanese in the camps who said, we're not going to fight for a government that's locking us and our families up, good, good for them. Um, and that argument was made to gay people of if you prove your loyalty and your masculinity um, by fighting, um, then maybe you'll win equal rights. Hasn't really worked out. So why is it, you know, that gonna that bargain gonna be work out any better for women than it has for these other groups? I would really strongly recommend uh, a little chapbook by a collective called Against Equality, which is a radical queer group. Um, one of their books is specifically, uh, it's called Don't Ask Us to Fight Their Wars, and it's a critique of the argument that uh, gay people should go into the military um, in order to win equal rights. Um, and much of it's also applicable to um, other groups such as women. Yeah, thank you so much, Edward and Rivera, for your comments. And also, thank you so much, Susan, for your question. Uh, your question actually speaks directly to something I've been working on recently, which is introducing to the National Organization for Women a resolution in order to advocate for ending draft registration for all. And that resolution actually has passed successfully in, in the Illinois National Organization for Women chapter. Um, so um, we get back to the central question, which plagues groups like National Organization for Women, which is in advocacy for uh, equal rights amendment, you often get counter arguments that, oh, well, if, if we would like complete equal rights for women, we have to have the issue of the draft. Um, we have to have the issue of the draft um, front and center as some sort of proof that women do want equality in all forms. But when you look at the argument itself, the argument is really made in bad faith in order to discredit other arguments that women deserve equal rights in all aspects. And so rather than accept their premises, what many fem intersectional feminist advocates, including myself, have been doing is looking at how we can actually change the argument, change the framing, um, look at equal rights in, in, in terms of actual equity, in terms of actual um, um, rights that people have been asking for for years, rather than caving into the argument that um, in order to achieve equal rights, we must have equal um, injustice for both for all genders. Um, so yeah, uh, it's it's definitely an, uh, a wedge that that has tried that, that uh, opponents of women's rights have used against women's groups advocating for greater rights, um, advocating that they are equally oppressed by systems that are oppressive and patriarchal towards men as well. Um, but I think, especially in this new age of feminist advocacy and this new wave of feminism, I think opponents of draft registration have found ways to both support the Equal Rights Amendment and, uh, and support equal rights for women, as well as um, oppose 
um, militarism and oppose violence that can be perpetuated against women in these systems that they're either forced into or just expected to be in against their will. Um, so yeah, I think, um, thank you so much um, for bringing that up because I think it's, it's a definitely an important argument, especially when it comes to congressional arguments regarding draft mm -hmm. registration. And I think it's one reason that um, there has been less resistance to draft registration than uh, in, in Congress than there is in public opinion. Uh, it's because they've caved into these arguments that actually are just made not in, in, in the interest of women, but in the interest of preserving a conservative status quo. Sebastian, can I chime in just one more thing about this? Yes, please. Go ahead. Around this issue again and again and again for years, what I've found is that we are presented with a false choice. You know, where we're said you're you're either a sexist and you don't want women to be drafted, or you are a feminist and women should be drafted. And that itself is a hangover from patriarchy, the either or option, rather than the diversity of opinions, op options, the complexity of the issues. And it is also how um, the people in power continue to preserve their power, basically, by presenting us with two choices, neither of which are acceptable to the general populace, actually. Um, and so I just wanted to bring that up is to be really wary on this issue and many others about those false choices that are constantly thrown up in front of us and to always get back to the radical roots. Um, if we presented in a legit, in a, a, a strong sense that had to be listened to the list of feminist uh, points that had to be checked off before they could even talk to us, about drafting us, they would we would transform this whole world, right? We would be like, well, we want a trillion dollars a year for peace building around the world. Oh, well, we want economic justice for the global South. Oh, well, we want a, a friendship with China program first before you even point your missiles in that direction. Um, oh, well, we want to see women at every level of decision-making. Oh, well, we want a national peace education program so that our youth uh, coming up through the education system know that war is not our only option. At which point we wouldn't even be talking about the necessity for a draft because we'd be talking about things like, oh, well, how do we fund living wage jobs for peace builders doing unarmed peacekeeping in war zones that have requested the aid of international peacekeepers? Because that's a feminist forward policy approach to global conflict. So it's always important to remember that they're trying to shove us into this either or choice, which is not the paradigm uh, that is supported by feminists to begin with. I would agree very much with Rivera that, it, that, it, that there's, a, there's a deliberate agenda of, of misframing this issue. And I think that's also motivated, um, at least uh, subconsciously, if not consciously, by a desire by those in power not to have the subalterns realize their power of nonviolent direct action. The government does not want young people to realize that the reason they're asking them to sign up for a draft is that the government needs them and depends on their active collaboration to wage longer, larger, less popular wars. There's an ageist misconception of this that I think infects young people as well. It's like, well, the purpose of an anti-draft movement is to stop the draft and to protect these vulnerable, disempowered young people against the injustice of the draft. If I just wanted not to fight, I would have stayed home and not spoken out and wouldn't have gone to prison. The reason I resisted the draft was not to stay out of the draft, but to prevent a draft and by doing so, to prevent larger, longer, less popular wars. So I think we need to think about this and the government does not want us to think about this and it's our role as theoreticians, as scholars, as practitioners of nonviolent direct action to communicate to young people the power they have. It's not about stopping the draft. They have the power if they can force and we with them can force public recognition that a draft is not a policy option to introduce what would be one of the most meaningful constraints on war planning that could be imagined. 
This is why they do not want us to recognize our power. That's why um, one of my, my mentors in draft resistance and in nonviolent activism, Dave Bellinger, actually came to my trial um, when I was on trial for refusing to register, titled one of his books, More Power Than We Know, which is really a profound lesson um, that, again, it's up to us to pass on, to let people know. This should be something where we recognize that by amplifying um, young people's resistance, we can, we can actually help have a practical effect on war making. And through engaging in this, this should be something for young people who are looking for, and for teachers who are looking for, how can we actually make people feel, young people feel empowered? This is the place. This is the place if young people are going to wield power directly nonviolently against the war machine. And that's why the government wants them to collaborate and not to realize that they have a choice because they have people power. Yeah, thank you so much, Edward. That's a very important point. Um, and I'd love to pass uh, the, I'd love to pass the ability to ask questions onto Lee Smithy from Swarthmore College. Hi everybody. Um, and thanks so much for this panel and presentation and the opportunity to interact. Um, I, did, I wanted to ask some of our institutions, including where I teach at Swarthmore College, have um, fallen prey to the Chamberlain Project, um, which is a project funded by Jonathan Soros to create special positions for retiring military officers to join the faculty. And um, I'm just curious if, I mean, I can imagine ways in which to connect the dot between what you're talking about related to the draft um, and the Soros, uh, sorry, the uh, Chamberlain project. I'm just curious if you have run across it in any of your work related to the draft or um, yeah, if you have any comments on that at all. Well, maybe we'd run across it more if uh, more of a, the Peace and Justice Studies of professors asked us to come talk about the draft in their class. Then we could go toe to toe with those folks with a, a lot of loving kindness. Um, no, seriously, Lee, um, I, I think it's another example of the creeping militarism. I mean, I don't know if it's creeping. It's like a tidal wave militarism policy in the U.S., um, kind of institutionalizing itself throughout the country. We know as far as M empires go, this is a very bad sign for the US empire. It's a really late stage empire issue. Um, so I don't know how much wisdom there is in it, uh, but yeah, it's a good question. It kind of depends on who's getting placed as well. I mean, we're on a panel here with Rosa who is a anti, anti war and militarism veteran, right? So, uh, we could be getting placements for Veterans for Peace all over the, the university system. Maybe we should hack their system. I, I'm curious what the, what they are teaching. Are they teaching in an, in an ROTC program or they're just teaching like what? Um, it could be in any department. Essentially, it's kind of like a pool where uh, retired military officers can put an application into the pool and then um, participating colleges can uh, hire a faculty member from that pool. So the pool might have, you know, someone who's a literature person one year. And when I say that, I mean, uh, someone with a PhD who's a retiring military officer, you know, in English or engineering or physics or political science. Um, and, you know, at least at Swarthmore, the departments would make you know, like the political science department might say, I want to pull somebody from that pool to fill this position at Swarthmore. Um, I'll just add quickly that at Swarthmore, um, the Student Government Association and the faculty, in fact, the faculty passed a resolution calling on the president to remove us from the Chamberlain project. Um, it, was, it was a real surprise to faculty to find a year after we joined the Chamberlain project that we had been unilaterally added into the project by the president. And our logo had apparently been on the website for about a year before we found out. And then it 
came into sort of faculty, the faculty meeting sphere and agenda. And we ended up having a number of faculty meetings about it and passing a resolution um, calling for us to be removed from the project. But despite the coalitions of students and the Student Government Association and the faculty resolution, the president announced that we would remain part of the Chamberlain project uh, regardless. Um, so, uh, but, and I, I just wanna, last thing I wanted to throw in here is that we were very, sorry about my dogs. Um, we were very clear um, among uh, many of us in the faculty about saying this is very much not about excluding military voices from conversations on campus. We think that there's all sorts of ways that, as Rivera pointed out, you know, we can invite speakers, we can hold conferences, we can have symposia, we can invite Rosa to come speak on campus, um, and that it's also not excluding um, retiring military officers from with PhDs from applying for positions in any department on campus and getting a job on the basis of their um, academic qualifications. It's the um, it's the making positions, which you know, like many institutions, we're also trying to diversify our faculty in other important ways related to race, gender, indigeneity, et cetera. Um, so at any rate, it's the making the positions tied to military training that was problematic for many. And, and also, it just seems like what you're going to get from those people because they're part of the, the Chamberlain project, like yes. then already it's established that like you are still speaking for the military. So you better toe the party line. You know, there's plenty of retiring officers probably who have uh, a lot of opinions about their service, what happened, the wars and everything that as soon as they're part of that project, they're like, oh, well, now I'm like still representing the system and the organization that that, that just seems um, kind of toxic and, and it just rife for for propaganda and one sidedness. You know, this um, partly it's uh, an echo of a broader theme in more recent years in which only people within the military are deemed competent to speak about military and foreign policy issues, which seems to reverse what I was brought up to think was the paramountcy of civilian over military authority. You know, I have relatives who, who older relatives who cheered when, you know, Truman fired MacArthur for bucking the civilian leadership. Um, but uh, more than that, I think the, 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 the tie-in that's been made to this in anti-draft discussion has not been at the college level, but at the high school level, where you may not realize that for years, there have been tens of thousands of military officers teaching in high schools as part of junior ROTC programs. And the same bill, this year's National Defense Bill, that includes the expansion of draft registration to women, also includes a mandate for the expansion of junior ROTC into more high schools. And it, you know, schools are really pressured because high schools, um, high schools get these people as free military funded teachers and they're places where like they can't afford any other teachers. So high school students who wanna meet the required gym class requirement, the only gym class that's offered that they can get into is a junior ROTC class that also includes uh, indoctrination in, in military regimentation, regimentation and legitimation of the military and is an adjunct to military recruiting. So we see all of that. And if you want to know just how toxic it gets, something that many people don't realize is that the shooter at Benman High School in Florida carried out that shooting in his junior ROTC uniform t-shirt. He had learned to shoot on the J ROTC shooting range in his high school. And he considered that mass murder to be the exemplification of the values which he had been taught in junior ROTC. Yeah, thank you so much. Edward. I just like to add to your point as well. Um, the push against JROTC programs has also historically been intimately connected to the push against the draft. So even at Dartmouth College, uh, in 1969, we had the Parkhurst protest, which was an occupation of an administrative building um, carried out by anti-war activists who were pushing specifically against the presence of the JROTC program at Dartmouth. And eventually it led to a decision to actually abolish the program at Dartmouth for a while. But after a while, um, considering that there was some inaction on the part of activists or there was some lack of um, lack of actual um, 
adherence to that principle that that JRTC program would not be established at Dartmouth, uh, it slowly creeped back and was reestablished after a while. Um, so definitely you can see, um, even if there are student move movements, even if there's press pressure on administration to move away, away, away from militarism when it comes to academics, when it comes to uh, who they privilege in conversations um, with, between professors and, ac and academics and students, um, there always is an, inevitably this militarism that does creep into discussions that does overrule even what students ask for and want, and even what a faculty has asked for and wants. Um, so definitely there's really a big importance of some solidarity between students, professors, and other faculty um, when it comes to pushing back against certain programs that do disproportionately represent some voices um, over others. Um, and so I guess that perfectly leads us into our next question, um, which I'd love to ask, um, which is um, essentially, um, how can professors and students bring up uh, the issue of draft registration to draft age youth as it relates to issues of peace, conflict resolution, and social justice? Um, yeah, so I guess we've seen a lot of how certain, how this relates to many different areas um, and how it could possibly apply to academic conversations. And I'd just love to hear your thoughts on Rivera, Rosa, and Edward on how you think this can be brought to the classroom. Yeah, great. Uh, before I go into that, I just want to briefly touch on the poverty draft, which Rosa brought up earlier and connects very deeply to recruitment and the and the whole concept of the draft. We hear this all the time, like, oh, well, if we don't have a, a lottery-based draft, then poor people get drafted because it's their only option. And again, the answer to this is not to have a universal draft. Oh, I shouldn't say universal. A draft of all young people, um, but rather to have... Um, affordable college education and jobs guarantee, two policies which are robustly supported by young people and indeed the general populace, um, and to address the issues in that manner, not by drafting uh, people at large. So uh, how can professors uh, work on this issue with their students? Uh, first of all, reach out to anti-war students who already exist at your university, see if they're already alerted to this and see if they would like to come and speak in your classrooms. Reach out to your other professors, particularly in your peace studies department, uh, because you are really core allies to youth and to anti-draft activists in making sure the message gets to the people who, who need to hear it. Um, there are ways to resist registering for the draft. And uh, there is a long history of how this is done. Some of it, as Edward mentioned, is really simple by failing to update your address, right? Other ways may include printing out your draft form, sending it back with, I want to be a CO, which they won't know what to do with. And then they have to get in contact with you and you have an opportunity to continue to resist. Uh, we would love to see a massive resistance to the rollout of draft, expanding the draft registration to young women. Uh, this is going to take organizing and allyship, and we really hope that you will help spread the word among your other peace and justice studies professors, because if we are going to achieve these goals, this is a really critical time to do it in. Edward and I and other people and Sebastian and other people in the No Draft Network have been tracking this year, this issue through years of slow legislative process. And we are at the point where active resistance is now. It's going to happen soon. So please uh, do get a hold of us, do stay in contact with this issue. And um, groups like Code Pink should be rolling out a, a plan of resistance uh, pretty soon. And other groups like Truth and Recruitment and uh, our allies will each be reaching out about how we can support and be allies to young people who rightly feel that this is an injustice. I would say there, you know, a couple things. I mean, we've been talking about some of the ideas that could be raised, but I think in terms of scholarship, um, in terms of scholarship, there's, there's, there's a couple things. One is as, as, as a history project, there is no significant published history um, of the draft resistance movement or even of selective service since 1980, which if you think about it is actually a longer period. The current 
program of draft registration and why and how it is that registration is continued, although it's been unenforceable for 40 years. That's a longer period than the entire period of the draft from you know, World War II through the Vietnam era, which has been the subject of profuse scholarship. There is an enormous gap. There are many dissertations that could be written, much less student papers. This is something that could be a topic for a symposium, for research, for multiple dissertations in history and peace studies. And it's an empty field, empty, empty, empty. My website is the best source about the history of the draft for the last 40 years, I say not to boast, but because it's so thin compared to what real historical scholars could do with this topic and the many lessons to be drawn out of it. Second, I think that this is, this is a teachable moment in spades. Um, if you want to bring things in, this is more than one guest lecture in a class, although certainly that's a welcome place to start. We're in, as Rivera told us, a critical moment. Congress is going to vote by the end of this year to expand draft registration to women. That will take in effect probably, we don't know because that will authorize the president to will give the president to issue a proclamation, which President Biden will issue, which will set the deadlines in the program. But best guesstimate of startup date is we're looking at women born in 2005 and after having to register as they turn 18 starting in 2023. We've got between one and two years now to build a movement and to educate people and to think about what choices are available and what choice would be made. This should be the subject of entire multi-day symposia in your departments over the next year. There is no topic more timely and relevant to your students' lives. And it will become increasingly so to new students. But this is our window of opportunity to explore this so that the initial response is informed rather than based purely on government propaganda that asks only whether the government wants or thinks it needs a draft and doesn't entertain the question of whether people will willingly, whether women will willingly submit in the ways that men have not. So there's a whole range of, of activities that could be done in an academic context at varying degrees of depth. Um, but again, if you, want, if you want hooks for academic work, and I know lots of professors are looking for, gee, what could we talk about that would engage this one once people see what's happening and understand what it means and the power they have, this will hook your students. Yeah, thank you so much Ed, for that point. And I think also your point is one, one of the points that brought me to anti-draft advocacy or uh, advocacy to end the draft in the first place. We look at historical periods of time, um, like, like the 70s and the 80s um, when the draft was instated and when the draft is and historically the draft is seen as a large injustice something that people under it uh, people who are under it um suffered under and worse and actually um caused you know generational trauma that is only now even being understood um as we study the past um and yet today we still have a similar situation of draft registration and there's still the potential of conscript, uh, there's still conscription and there's a potential of instatement of the draft, um, no matter how unlikely people say that is. And so rather than having preventative politics uh, and understanding the potential issues with draft registration as it is, um, and looking at the past as a, as a, um, as a, a lesson in what we can do to prevent this happening again. Um, we've had this kind of historical amnesia, which forgets what happened in Vietnam and forgets what happened in Korea and allows draft registration to continue in its present form. And so I think um, what's not being done enough today is kind of creating this continuum between the past and the present and how we can improve on what happened what, from what happened before uh, till now. Um, and yeah, I think just understanding how we can um, move past just uh, locking this period of, where we just look at draft registration as a past issue that happened just maybe in the 80s and 70s um, and looking into how we can oppose it today and how we can actively work against it um, as it's being expanded before our eyes is really an important way to kind of bridge that intergenerational gap and also understand how history can be applied to modern day as well. Can I add one more note there, Sebastian, about uh, how you can organize around this? Uh, to remember to reach out to your colleagues who are in women's studies and gender studies. 
uh, we've been talking about this from an intersectional lens and uh, we need to think intersectionally as we organize as well. Uh, even if you know it's a stretch for them to think about the draft as an issue, it certainly is right square in the middle of their wheelhouse when we start talking about it as an issue of forcing women's bodies to do things that women don't want to do. Um, which is essentially the, the nut of this whole thing. Uh, always remember that this is a deeply intersectional issue and that we cannot achieve our freedom from oppression through systems that inherently oppress others. And war, no matter how well-intentioned it may be, and it is far from well-intentioned at this point in the United States uh, practice of war, can never uh, be a, tr a really liberational force in that sense. If we're using violence to get our way, if we're using our military might to subdue and conquer other people, if we're expanding our militarism and our imperialism and our worldview upon other peoples, there is nothing that is liberational about that behavior. And so we, we've learned difficult with great difficulty over the years that we cannot rise by pushing other people down this is the great lesson of intersectionality so you cannot climb that ladder by shoving someone else further and so this issue really taps into that and i think young people today are more and more conscious about that that's why we see um black lives matter activists standing up for palestinian rights that's why we see um LGBTQ persons standing up to end family separation at the border. That's why we see uh, young people who are anti-war understanding that the Pentagon is the biggest polluter and causer of uh, the climate crisis as a single entity. So intersectionality is the, the way of thinking about the world, increasingly so. And this issue really kind of stands, strangely enough, in the core of it as an issue that affects every single young person in this country and forces them to subscribe to supporting the, uh, the very injustices and oppressions that they may oppose. So thank you, thank you all for being here today and for really uh, spending the time with this issue and for caring uh, about it. And I know you'll go out and make sure people know about it. Rosa, is there anything you wanna add? Uh, I mean, I think the only thing that we talked about before that we were going to bring up is just how narrow, I mean, if people, you know, you know, the slippery slope, when I joined, I was like, um, war, there's no way I'm going to serve in a war, I'm going to be maybe called up to uh, fight a forest fire in Montana, it's very dry there, that's what the National Guard is there for, like natural disasters, I was like, Vietnam, oh, everybody learned their lesson from that, what a disaster, we're past that, we're evolved. Um, and so if there were that slippery slope of, okay, now we're in a war and okay, uh, not enough people want to, uh, are in to serve and, and the draft was somehow activated and tapped into the, the ways of, there, there's no way out. That contract is kind of ironclad and the only way out is to prove that you're a conscientious objector, which the burden of proof is on you. If you're not devoutly religious, it, it, it's, um, they don't really believe you. They're like, well, if you don't believe in uh, the traditional God, then how can you have morals? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, um, and uh, just that it's it's so long, the whole entire process takes over a year and it uh, it's really designed to make you, make you jump through all the hoops and, and get worn down and worn down and, and face all of the, you know, the, the guilt and um, the hazing and people ostracizing you, um, that, that's your only way out. If you have any other disagreements and you're like, well, I just don't wanna serve and you know, maybe I don't have it all figured out why I don't want to, but this feels wrong. And you don't necessarily want to prescribe to like, well, now my ideology is that I am against all wars completely. So therefore I, I um, am a CEO that it's, I meet the definition um, that in itself is it's just, um, I don't know. I'm talking about this. It's all, yeah, it's it's just, it's just a, like a kind of oppressive, kind of a trap, and we don't want anybody to be trapped in something that they don't want to do, especially if it involves war and killing and killing people, harming the environment, 
all of those nasty things that come along with war. So that's why I was going to add. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rosa. I think to guide to tie together some of the issues that we've been speaking about, I'd like to ask, I guess, maybe one or two final questions. Um, so one of the questions I'd love to ask both Rosa and, Edward, and Rivera can feel free to also chime in, is um, throughout history, innocent civilians have unfortunately been caught in the crossfires of war, including many who simply live in areas of conflict and become victims of international conflict. Um, so for both Rosa, you and Edward as well, uh, what was the experience of conscience objection and seeking conscience objection, objection um, like? Um, and how do you think this relates to the modern era, or era considering that um, many Americans may seek to avoid military draft registration on humanitarian grounds or reasons of conscience, especially as the younger generation has become more politically um, uh, aware of uh, different implications of militarism, violence, and peace. Yeah, I love that people are starting to wake up and see the patterns of like, oh, we don't go to war in countries where they look like like the leadership of this country. <laughs> like we're not invading um, England or, you know, it, it's all these countries that um, third world countries and poor countries, countries where quote unquote, you know, brown people live. And, and a, a lot of times, uh, you know, minorities, people of color in the military then are, are forced to grapple with that. Be like, I, wait a minute, um, I'm, you know, I'm a person of color now perpetually. Um, committing violent acts against other people of color who are just struggling and the the you know it's, we've got tanks and planes and drones on our side and little tiny villages with IEDs that are detonated by phones um, on the other side and it, it's just a, such a messy situation and that's partly why I became a CEO you know I was paying attention to the news and um, the stories of soldiers coming back and um, and the marketplace bombings, the suicide bombers killing like 200 of their um, just innocent civilians. The, the civilian death toll really, it just, it, it shot up way above the military death toll so quickly. Um, I think now the estimate of, is 1 million innocent, innocent civilians were killed in the war on terror. Um, and it was just something that I could not be a part of. And, and I think that but yeah, I think young people are starting to to wake up to um, some of those issues, and and it's great to see because yeah, I think a lot of people would object. Like, wait a minute, I, I no, I'm I'm not going to be a part of this. I think there are a couple of lessons in in Rosa's story, and I appreciate your your, your highlighting those things, Rosa. Um, one is just how narrow and difficult the pathway of, of opting out of the military through seeking CO status um, is, even if it, in theory you qualify. And equally importantly, that the further you've gone into the military, um, the more difficult it gets to get out. The easiest and safest way to opt out is at the start by not signing the enlistment contract in the first place or not signing the registration form in the first place. Now, there are those who will say, oh, well, you don't know that you're going to be ordered to war commit war crimes. Well, wait until you're on the battlefield and you're ordered to commit war crimes to opt out, at which point you get you know, shot for desertion, right? Um, or at least court-martialed. So, I mean, it's not really very realistic, but that's the kind of bogus argument that people will make. But I think it's, it's really important to realize that there is a continuum. And you know, at one end, there are people who object to all wars, and that's a small group of people. And at the other end, there are people who'd be willing to fight any war and kill anybody the government tells them to regard as an enemy. Those are called sociopaths. Um, and those are the people, really, unless you'd be, when you, when you agree to be registered for a draft, you're agreeing to fight any war the government wants you to fight. You shouldn't do that unless you're a sociopath who's willing to kill anybody they tell you to kill. The vast majority of the people are somewhere in the middle. They believe in some kind of just war theory, that there are some just wars and some unjust wars, and they want to make their own choice. And there's a really good recent essay by um, uh, a young guy, um, I think now maybe just over draft age, um, uh, Ethan Foote, that he wrote recently. Um, uh, that was published um, it was published a couple of places, including on my site. Um, it was published first on waging nonviolence, I think. 
And he makes the point that, you know, they're telling us that, well, unless you are somebody who objects to all war, then there's no, you should be willing to accept the draft. But his argument, and I think he's totally right here, is you shouldn't even think about submitting to a draft unless you're willing to fight any war. Um, and, and, you know, really the burden of proof needs to be reversed. But draft resistance is a tactic that's open to a much wider spectrum of people and that traditionally has been engaged in, in by a lot of people because they knew that they wouldn't qualify as COs. But it's also, there are a lot of people, including me, who probably would have been at least an edge case able to qualify, or at least theoretically qualified. It would have fared poorly for the reasons Rosa explained because I'm, I'm an atheist um, before a draft board. Um, but at least in theory, my views might qualify, but I chose not to register because my goal wasn't to opt myself out, but to actually obstruct the operation of the war machine. If you register thinking that if drafted, you'll seek CO status, you that will be publicly counted by the selective service system as a vote of confidence and a vote of willingness to be drafted. They constantly talk about these numbers as an indication of how willing to submit young people are and how they acquiesce in this system. So know that it's not merely an action that will affect your life, but it will be taken as a public political statement. Yeah, thank you so much, Edward. And I, before we close out, uh, I would love to open the floor to any audience questions. Um, and then after audience questions, uh, we can definitely end out considering we're coming on the end of time. I, I can, yeah, it's going to echo. Um. Uh, okay, that worked. Thank you. Um, so my just one question I have for um, Rosa, I guess, um, about conscientious objection. Uh, you know, I've taught it. I've taught it through some film. Um, I'm wondering just this is not terribly important, but it's a question I'm just curious about to ask you. Are you familiar with the uh, movie? I think it's called Hacksaw Ridge. It's 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 a complicated. It's about. Um, a real conscientious objector in World War II. Um, and it's Mel Gibson film, not a big fan of his anymore. Um, it never really was entirely, but there's a lot of violence in it. So I'm not crazy about it. But the fact that uh, the young man, I can't remember his name now, who stood out as a conscious ob objector and went through a trial and all. I, I just thought I'd ask you what your thoughts are on that. If you, I mean, obviously having you come to my class is, I, is ideal and, and Rivera and, and anyone else, uh, Edward, who can come, but I'm curious about films or or what's teachable. Um, Edward's Edward Lee put Edward's um, a link to Edward's work, and and I can assign that. But they're so visual, and that's why I went with that one film. I also I'm trying to think if there's anything else I've taught them through film, but that one comes. Oh, well, Sophie Scholl and the White Rose, uh, but that's that's. That's that's Germany. So I just thought if, if you or any of you know any uh, visuals that I could share with my class on conscientious objection. I think um, there was a documentary, was, I think it was called Breaking Ranks or something. Oh, you're muted or I can't hear you actually. Oh. Um, I can, can hear you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Oh, but now we've got the ringing, I think. Okay. Um, I think there was a documentary called I think it was called Breaking Ranks, but it, it profiles maybe five or six vets from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. So like you, you get the younger generation. Um, I don't know if they were all COs, but I know some of them uh, fled the country and, and stuff, but 
yeah, it's kind of a taboo um, thing to, and, and with the military having such strings in Hollywood and that you know, the military pretty much okays any script that has um, military equipment or, or even I think storylines that they really have their hands in everything that comes um, out in a, in a mainstream movie, I guess. So I, I don't know if I have a lot of resources for you, but I just um, I just asked for the rights back to, to my book because I wanna offer it for much cheaper. And it, there's an audiobook version of it. If you're looking for different mediums, like maybe they could listen. And, um, but you know, my, my story isn't, isn't the typical one. I refuse to ship out. So I, I didn't like go to war and then decide oh my God, I can't do this, I'm a CEO. I, I decided pretty early on, like, oh my God, this is the biggest mistake I've ever made. What if I don't belong here? What am I doing? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I wish I had more resources. Other people? There is, um, you know, there there's more literature about draft resistance than people realize. I've been working on a literature review and I'm up to something like 35 memoirs of draft resistors, of amazing diversity from the Vietnam period, most of them little known and out of print um, and unrecognized. But in terms of visual materials, um, part of the historical deficit is that there's no good filmic treatment of the draft resistance movement in the 1980s. There's no good filmic treatment of the anti-war movement of the 1980s, which was larger than the anti Vietnam movement. There's no good filmic treatment of the larger anti-Reagan movement of which it was a part, which has many lessons for the anti-Trump movement that were not heeded. There's no film about the largest political demonstration in American history, the gathering of more than a million people in Central Park in 1982 that I was part of for unilateral nuclear disarmament. So there's plenty of room for interesting historical filmmaking. But the modern period is not covered. The best thing on draft resistance by far, although flawed or at least limited, is a new documentary. Rosa just, I mean, Rivera just put a, a pointer to it, I think, in the, in the links. And it's just become available. There's going to be a, a public online streaming um, and a panel with some of the key participants, including David Harris and Joan Baez, next week. Uh, it's called The Boys Who Said No, which is an allusion to that poster of uh, Joan Baez and her two sisters under the slogan, boys say yes to girl, I mean, girls say yes to boys who say no, um, which Joan laughs off the, I asked her about it at one point during the, the making of the movie and she just laughed off the critique that had been made of that as exemplifying sexism. Anyway, it's a great movie about draft resistance during the Vietnam War and will be the defining history of it. And it is well worth watching, but you're gonna have to supplement it because it has zero intersectionality. It's a very narrow focus on a particular school and segment of draft resistance and a particular set of motivations that doesn't draw in most of what we're gonna be talking about and that cuts off in you know, 1973 with the end of the Vietnam draft. So it doesn't really bring out any of the ways that the draft resistance movement in the 80s and after has been quite different, including the ways in which it has been much more intersectional. Um, so, but it's still really worth watching and would be a starting point for a class discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to chime in or anybody else who would like to ask a question? A, a, a more, if you want a more intersectional perspective, but from an even more distant period, there, there is a documentary um, uh, about the uh, draft resistance by Japanese Americans in the camps during World War II, and I don't remember the name of it. There's a very good, very readable book of legal history um, that my cousin-in-law, who's a law professor at Chapel Hill, Eric Muller, wrote called Free to Die for Their Country, which although he's a law professor, it's really good storytelling. Um, and, and that, I think, ties together a little more of these arguments about, can you earn equality and earn freedom by serving in the military? 
Um, but again, more distant past. There is a, there, but there's a movie about um, about that uh, that set of incidents in the in the Japanese American internment camps and the draft resistance there. And when we're getting done. we're getting the hook here that no, it's time. No, no, when you're done. Okay. Just bring it downstairs. Ah, okay. I don't want it locked in the room because it's it's tonight's ah. computer. Oh yeah. I'm using a borrowed computer, which I need to give back in due course because we're having problems with mine. All right. Uh, so I guess uh, with that, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Uh, it's been a really great conversation, and we've definitely just scratched the surface of many, many broader arguments and many different intersectionalities that the draft has with many um, other issues uh, related to race, class, gender, um, age, and uh, many other issues. Um, and it's been a really good conversation with all of you and it's been really great to meet um, all of the attendees. Um, so uh, I guess if Rivera and Rosa and Edward would like to drop any information in the chat before we leave, um, I think that'll be all. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. It's great. And I have Hi to there. thank, Ooh. I have to thank Sebastian for initiating and organizing this um, and for your leadership. Um, it excites me to see a new generation of people coming forward and, and seeing the potential in this in this issue, um, even when there wasn't any you know, organization or group around you doing it. Thank you for stepping up and I hope more people will do likewise. Thank you so much. All right, goodbye. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Sebastian. Great job. <laughs>